Father in heaven, our dear sister just sang the song that is the burden of our hearts. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So, Father, we come to you and we happily admit our weaknesses and our frailties and we present them before you. And we ask that you will fulfill your word in our experience. Be with me as I speak. May my words only be those that are approved of heaven. May my stories be appropriate. May all that I do point people back to the Lord and Savior, even Jesus, whoever liveth to make intercession for them. So be with us now, Lord, as we open your word. And thank you for bringing us here to this house, this house of prayer. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So I'm going to draw something on the wall. Because as we were praying, the Lord showed me a way to, to teach this principle before telling the principle, okay? So maybe I can put this here. Oh, I know what I'll do. Oops. And, um, all right. There's a clicker. Let me tell you this. I'm going to go through some things here. Let me draw this first. So what I'm going to draw on here is something all of us understand. Raise your hand if you know where women came from. Anybody in here know where women came from? Man. Raise your hand. Women came from men. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, God brought the woman out of man. Everybody understand that principle? So you have, you made a, and I'm going to title this, coming out. This is not like a gay coming out. This is like an origin of coming out. So you had Adam. He didn't look like this. But this is my figure of Adam, okay? And so God took Adam, had him go to sleep. And why did God have Adam go to sleep? Because he was going to perform surgery, because in order to have a woman, he must have pain. Let me say it again. It is impossible for a man to have love and not have pain. Because it is impossible for a woman to have love and not have pain. In order to have children, a woman suffers. But in order to have love, a man must suffer. Do you understand this principle? Husbands, love your wives as Christ also did what? Loved the church and gave himself for it. How did he give it? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Love equals suffering in the beginning. And why am I making this point? There was a coming out, and God created this happy woman. I don't, she was naked, so, you know, but God made her, right? Right? Now, then there was another coming out. 
And the other coming out, anybody in here know what the next coming out in the Bible was? Okay, they did come out of Eden. That's true. Man, that's a good one. Hadn't thought about that one. That is very good. But now, mm, that's actually really good, brother. Thank you. I, I'm going to use that one for later. Thank you. I was thinking of, you had, this was, this was Adam. And I'm going to draw his name in red because that's what it meant. Adam was red. That means you could see his blood or, you know, his, his, his color. He wasn't just plain white or black. He was kind of reddish in color. And so then you had uh, the coming out. So I'm going to put another one. So you had uh, Eden, as the brother mentioned. And you had a coming out into what? The world, right? The church was in Eden, a protected place, and then the church was sent into the world, an unprotected place. Right? All right, so after Eden, anybody remember the next thing that happened? Okay, so then they, God sent, yes, sir, in the back? That's right. So God brought Noah out of the old world. So you had the world, right? And a coming out. And the one that came out was Noah and his family. You catch that? Now the Bible says upon the testimony of two or what? Three, a thing is what? Established. God wants to get to where there are no more coming out. Or no more separations. I want to bring you down to another one. Okay? So God had the children of Israel. They were in Egypt, right? So there was Egypt. And God brought out who? The Israelites. Okay, and when God brought out the Israelites, the children of Israel, and he brought them into the promised land and he gave them their own land. And then Israel, did Israel separate? And there, there was a separation and it wasn't a, this, this time there was separation just like there was, um, I didn't do Abraham because I would have done Eden to the world and then uh, the world to Noah. But then after Noah, it was really Abraham. You understand there are other people. I'm not listing everybody. And after Israel came out, who came out or was left after Israel? That's right. Judah was there. Right. And then Judah, what happened to Judah? Judah went where? Where did all the children of Israel end up going? They went to Babylon. And so while the children of Israel were in Babylon, God then called them out back to where? Back into Israel. Now, do you see what God keeps doing? God keeps, keeps trying to save his people from people who were supposed to worship God. Were they supposed to worship God in, in Adam and his wife? Were they supposed to worship God? Yes. And then something happened in the family and then everything got all messed up and then they, everybody got kicked out. <laughs> Anybody in here, you ever live in a place and you had roommates and they did something and then your landlord said, everybody's got to go? You know what? That just happened to my wife and I. We have a home in Arkansas we've had for since 2013, right? And now we have to move out of it. Why? Because we haven't been there. We've been here. The neighbors watch the house for us. Our landlord goes over and checks on it. And our landlord, he, that's, it's two acres on a 50-acre uh, uh, plot, and we don't have anybody around. We're surrounded by woods and on a dirt road. 
Nobody needs to be on our road unless you are there for business or you know somebody. And if you show up, the police came to my house one time and while we were there and they showed up and it was evening time and so he flashed his blue light. And I, I went out to him and I said, why'd you flash the blue light? He said, because everybody in Arkansas has an AR-15 and I didn't want to get shot. Right? And so people started breaking into our house. And we had all of our stuff there. We have a whole house. And our landlord said, I went one day. There was 12 bags of stuff that you guys had there for you know, getting ready to move or do what you're going to do with it. And the next day I came, there were only three bags left. Then the neighbor called and said, somebody's in your house. Somebody's at your house. So he drove down there. He, had, he, he, he brought Smith and Wesson to visit to, with him. Maybe it was old Henry. I don't know. And they went over there to go visit him, him and his friend. And they came there and all of a sudden trouble ensued. And now we got to go down. So next week after Sabbath, we have to drive down there and go get all of our stuff out the house. And that's OK, but I need you to think of this point. A child comes out of their mother and they become a separate entity, even though they are family. You know that there's going to be a what? A separation. Now, there doesn't have to be a separation. Now, I want you to know something. After today, you will never hear that noise ever again. Oh, because I got, we got the special board that we're going to put right up there on the wall. And we're going to put all the electronic stuff out there that, for the signal so there's not going to be the wall anymore. There's not going to be blocking it. And we got extra cords to lengthen and bring it out. So tomorrow morning, if you'll come and help us, the elder and I and whomever else, we're going to be fixing that part. So you'll never hear that annoying, satanic noise again. I need you to understand it's satanic. The prince of the power of the air wants you to focus on the thing that's annoying than, rather than the thing that's uplifting and might save your life. Okay, back to it. Israel came out of Babylon, but see, which one of these was God's church, Israel or Judah? Well, let me ask you a question. When she messed up and got them kicked out, which one of them did God say he was going to send his son for? Both of them, right? Now, listen to me. We can mess up and God could use both of us. But what if one of them decides I don't want to be fixed? You need to change. Does the gospel change? God will take the one that chooses. What did God want to save Egypt or Israel? What are you trying to tell me? God's not racist. He'll save Israelites and he'll save Egyptians. But they wear that crazy makeup. He'll save people that wear that crazy makeup. What if they wear them short skirts? Seriously? I agree. So why am I bringing this point? So here's what ended up happening. Let me move this over to here. When Jesus came on the scene, the people of God that were in Israel were now subject to the Romans. The majority had been taught false prophecy for so long that when the Messiah came, the prophecies of his coming had been so messed up by the leaders in the church, they had taught error for truth. You know what error is? It's truth that's been turned upside down. They taught it so wrong so that when Jesus came, everybody rejected him. Oh, man. What? Not him. Son of Joseph, the carpenter. Are you sure he can't be the Messiah? What about the big army he's coming with? See, so then what did Jesus do? He ordained what happened to those 12? They grew into a worldwide church. 
And then Paul came on the scene and said, you need to understand something. Something bad's about to happen. Go with me, your Bibles, to the book of uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says something amazing. Now we beseech you, brethren, by what, everyone? Anybody there? By the coming of who? Our Lord, Our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to catch this now. Where did Christ, where was Christ first coming? Where was his coming first mentioned? Anybody know? It was mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the Garden of Eden to Adam and his wife. And now listen, how many people in the world are related to Adam and his wife? How many are related to Noah? All of us. Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, there, uh, deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a what? A falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is... A, he, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So wait, why am I telling you this principle? Because what I'm going to show you today is why God does what he does. Did God want the people in Egypt to be lost? No, he wanted to save them and the plagues were a way to get them to... to Listen, sometimes God can't reach you until he breaks you. Some people don't have a come to Jesus moment until they're sitting in jail looking at 25 with an L. That's slang for 25 years to life. Sometimes it's only when your back is against the wall or your leg is broke or something bad has happened to you. Say, no, OK, Lord, OK, 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 OK. <laughs> What do you want? I don't know about you. Have you ever been there? I remember the first time the Lord came to me. I was 14. And he came to me every night. Every night I would dream a dream. And in my dream, I would see the world burning, the world destroyed. And it was scary. And then the Lord said, I want you to serve me. Now, see... I didn't have a daddy. And if you're a boy that grows up without a daddy, you grow up with your mom. And what is the number one thing that all women want? Hold on. Let me get it for you. have in my hand a book by Danielle Star, Starin, Staringji, I apologize, author of Menopause, a New, Repro a New Approach. She wrote this book called Woman's True Desire. She's an Adventist woman. And in here she states, don't believe anything she says because women will lie to hide this. The thing she wants more than anything, more than anything, is to be loved. That's her real desire. So if you see her coloring her hair or plucking things off her face or, or shaving all of her body or, or wearing heels this high or, or whatever she's doing, she's doing it with the motive to be loved. And what did God say is a man's first responsibility to his wife husbands do what and love her how 
to love her as Christ loved the church. But what if he won't love her? What if he keeps cheating on her? What if he treats her badly? When he finally shows that he doesn't love her and he cheats on her, God said, you now have permission to leave him to come out from this relationship. And when you come out from this relationship, God says, I will give you, if you give your heart to me, I will give you a better man. Now, you can't leave him unless he cheats. That means he lays in bed and has physical interaction with somebody else. But, the Lord says, even then, that's not my desire. My desire is that the two of you would be healed and be reconciled. But you can come out. Why am I giving you this principle? See, a woman wants to be loved because that's what, motive, that's what fills her gas tank. You want a woman to be happy? When she feels loved, she's like floating around the house. She's so happy. But connected to being love, her primary, one of the primary ways right next to love is security. So if there's no money in the bank and the bills are due, you can hold her hand and talk nice to her all you want. She's just going to be mad. You're not at work. And she sees you all day at home while, and there's money due, she's going to be mad. It doesn't matter how much you say you love her or how much you wash the dishes. She don't care. The bills need to be paid. So next to love, she says uh, security is financial and provision. That's why the Bible says if a man will not provide for his own, he is worse than in. So now listen, why am I, pastor, why are you making all this point about this stuff? See, when the church went worldwide, then there was a falling away. And those that fall away normally make up the larger share. And then God always has a people that he calls out. But sometimes he doesn't call them out like leave, okay, leave them like Abraham. What he does is he, he says, stay there. Because if they, the ones that don't choose to love, they'll put you out or they'll leave you. All right. My wife says, pa honey, she never says pastor. She says, honey, I like your talks better if I know where you're going. Right. So where am I going? OK. See, previously we talked about the seven points of intake. We talked about the history of the General Assembly of Free Seventh-day Adventists. We talked about organizational order, why that was important, about tithing to the organization, why that was important, pastoral accountability and discipline and why that was important. We talked about medical missionary training and its work and why that was important. Now, uh, we, and we've given out copies of the Constitution and bylaws, the, pro the proposed ones, but Today we're going to be covering, we're going to be covering the message for this time. The message for this time. And I love this picture, a book, the Bible with a tree growing out of it. How in the world do all trees and every plant and everything on the world exist? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And that is what causes us to have faith. And that's why we're talking about the message for this time, because we're getting ready for a harvest. We're talking about a bunch of new ones coming in, a bunch of little ones from this valley, a bunch of little ones from all over. There are so many that are ready for harvest, but the harvesters, the reapers need to be made ready. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews and chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, please. And we're going to go to verse 12. See, in preparing for the harvest, we need an intake process, a process that, that you know what to do when they bring them in. And the intake process exists for one reason, and that is to protect the truth. The Bible says in verse 12, 
For when, ye, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of what, everyone? Of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a what? He's a babe. But strong meat, that's something you can chew on and swallow. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When you can see the invisible because you understand the principles, now are you a teacher able to teach. And so in order to protect the truth. So this is ours. This is, this is what we're doing. This is why I'm sharing this thing. This is why we share the history of the General Assembly of Free Seventh-day Adventists. This is why we talk about organizational order. Listen, in all the churches of God, there must be order. But what if your church is just an independent self-church that, that, the, that the, a man or a woman started? Well, it has to be ordered, but let me ask you a question. If you cannot fire your pastor as a church, because everything is in his name and he owns the building, he owns, he has the bank accounts, you can't fire him. He's not a pastor, he's a pope. Do you understand my principle, what I'm saying? The people have to have the ability to remove their leaders if their leaders are not obedient to God. Because the people are really the ones in charge. Organizational order. Tithing. Why is tithing so important? Why is it that people who are on the board must be people who actually attend the church and actually support the church? Because what do words amount to? What is... Faith without works. Oh, I love you so much. Oh, I, I feel real bad that you and your wife are going to be sleeping in your car because you guys don't have any money to pay your rent. But the Lord be with you. God bless you. Do you understand what I'm saying, saints? See, what about pastor accountability? Listen, the pastor gets caught in some moral issue and they just move them to another church where nobody knows. No. Sit him down. And if it's of such a nature, pull his credentials. He can work privately for people, but he can't stand before the people as being endorsed by the organization. You understand what I'm saying? Accountability and discipline. Medical missionary training and work. Message for this time and the Constitution and bylaws. Because our methods must match our what? Now listen, if we have the highest message ever given to mankind, then our methods must match. And the men must match. So, preparing for the harvest. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, verse 10. We read this earlier. Thank you so much, my dear brother, for reading this. Romans 10, verse 10. Romans 10, verse 10. Look what the Bible says in Romans 10, 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness... And with the mouth, confession is made unto what? So now watch this. Can you have salvation if you don't confess the errors that you have made? See, these two things go together. You cannot have children without a husband and a wife or a man and woman coming together. These two things are linked. Verse 11. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be what? So God is looking for a people that are not going to be ashamed. Why? Because there are people of faith 
They have the faith of the Son of God who loved them and gave himself for them, and therefore they confessed their faults before one another, and then they made restitution or did that which was right before their brethren. Listen to me. There's nothing that you possess that's more valuable than salvation. There's nothing. Verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Do you know what's powerful about this verse? How many people is Jesus trying to save? He's trying to save the entire world. But he can't save the world if the church is corrupt. Let me say it again. If Adam and Eve are corrupt and they stayed in Eden, what would have happened to Eden? It would have been corrupted. God needs a people. You have your bulletin. Oh, turn your bulletin to the very back page. I want to thank my dear sister who does the bulletin. And, and sometimes she comes to church. She's like, Pastor, change all this stuff. But the pastor only changed the stuff because he and her didn't talk because he was going to change it. But anyway, look at the back of your bulletin. Look what the Bible says. Excuse me, not the Bible, but these quotes say. God will have a people, but in the days of purification of the church, but the days of the purification of the church are hastening on a pace. God will have a people pure and true and the mighty sifting soon to take place. We shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that his fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly plur, pur, plur, excuse me, purge his floor. That's Councils on, Councils of the Church, uh, page 338, paragraph 2. This is taken from darkness before, darkness before Dawn, page 37, paragraph 2. But God will have a people on the earth to maintain what? The Bible and what else? The Bible what? So now listen, Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen White only works in the church for those that believe. If you want to share truth with somebody, prove it from here. Prove it from here. This is why I learned a long time ago to show what I believe from this book. And then if they believe or if they're open, I'll show it to them from the spirit of prophecy. But I don't use the spirit of prophecy to prove anything to anybody. I show them, this is what God said. You can take it or leave it. Now, if they believe what God said and they believe the prophets, I said, well, I'll show you something even more clear or that may be more clear if you, you'll accept it. Look what it says. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of how many doctrines? All doctrines and the basis of how many reforms? All reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the, the creeds and, or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the what? Now watch this. I want you to think about this now. Who is the majority, the world or Noah? Who did God stand with? Noah. Who was the majority, Egypt or Israel? Who did God stand with? Who was the majority, Israel or Judah? Israel. Who did God stand with? Now, I want you to see upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is what? Who was the majority, Babylon or Israel? Who did God stand with? Who was the majority, Israel or the twelve? Who did God stand with? Which one of them had the word of God? Which one had the word of God? Everybody on here had the word. The word wasn't, go with me your Bible, the book of Psalms, chapter 19. Psalms 19. The word of God is not limited to Christians. Watch this. Psalms 19. Verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth what, everyone? Speech and not unto night showeth what? So wait a second. Who's preaching? 
The heavens and the earth preach to everybody. If people with open hearts look to the heavens, they will never believe in a flat earth. You know why? Because upon the testimony of two or three, a thing will be what? If the moon is round and the sun is round, then what must the earth be? If Venus is round and Jupiter is round, what must the earth be? You got it? Then it says, verse 3, there is how much speech? Anybody there? Psalms 19, verse 3. There is how much speech? No speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, God, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, coming, doing what out of his chamber? So the sun comes out to preach every morning. Which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices at the strong man to run a race. His going forth is from one end of the heaven and his circuit to the ends of, ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Go back with me to the book of Hebrews, excuse me, Romans chapter 10, please. Romans chapter 10. Look what the Bible says. We read in verse 12 that there was no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, anybody in here spell their name whosoever in the Bible? My name gets spelled like that all the time in the Bible. If any man, I'm like, oh, he's talking to me. Whosoever, oh, he must be talking to me. Just saying, put your name there. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a what? A preacher. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So, in order for mankind to be saved, God gives a message. But in order for the message to go into the world, God sends a man. And at the end of the world, he doesn't send one man. He sends a nation, a people that have the same spirit as the man Christ Jesus. And when they go out into the world... They give the message, but they use God's methods. What are his methods? What are his methods? I read, we just read this. I'm going to read it again. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible. And the Bible what? Only as the standard of how many doctrines? All doctrines. And the basis of how many reforms? All reforms, the opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or, de or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of what, everyone? The majority, the majority, the majority, the majority, the majority, the majority, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a what? Plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Now that's taken from the book, The Great Controversy, page 595, paragraph 1. See, the message of the gospel is liberty. Liberty. You know what liberty is? Yeah. Liberty. How many, how many nations in this world offer liberty? Raise your hand if you know how many nations on this planet at this time offer their people liberty. 
one. Liberty. But now watch this. Some have liberty for the men. You go to a Muslim state, or if you go to China and you're in the ruling class, or if you go to a, a Catholic state, if you belong to one of the privileged people, then you, you have liberty. But God says he wants liberty for how many people? All men. That means women, too, because women came out of what? Man. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 5. Look at what it says here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim what, everyone? Liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. If you're in debt, this verse is for you. If you owe on your house, if you owe on your car, this verse is for you. If you owe your neighbor, this verse is for you. If you are addicted to alcohol or drugs or any other substance, this verse is for you. If you are in an organization or if you are in a nation to where you're not free to worship God according to the dictates of your own character, this verse is for you. At our home, on, the, on, on, on Sabbaths and on the weekends, we're reading from this book called The Seventh Day Ox. We've read it multiple times. We love this book. But we just got to the chapter where Nikolai, the colonel just let Nikolai out the box. And now he has to start working with Maxim, that old ox, to try to start getting water, enough water in six days so that he can have Sabbaths off. This verse was for him. I'll just tell you something. Since it's a book and it's written, it's called The Seventh Day Ox and other miracle stories from, from, the, the, from Russia or the Soviet Union, uh, it works out. Spoiler alert. Anyway. And so, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them unto them beauty for what, everyone? The oil of joy for what? Anybody in here ever been sad because, Lord, we don't have enough money? I don't know what's going to happen with my, my relationship. My children, Lord, I called my son, he didn't answer. Lord, help me. He wants to give you the oil of joy for the for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be what? Glorified. And they shall build what? The old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your what? So wait a second. It's telling Israel, the children of Israel, that God was going to have the world come into the church. But they weren't going to live like the world. They were going to live like Christ. So we talked about the history of the free. But it starts with this, the great Second Advent moment, uh, movement from 1840 to 44. It's a part of what was called in American history the Great Awakenings. It was the third, now they've rewritten it and said it's the fourth, but it was the third Great Awakening. You can look up that term on Wikipedia if you want. And it started with this man here, William Miller. Now this man, a Baptist farmer who became a Baptist preacher, is the reason, listen to me, if it wasn't for him, black people would still be in slavery. Because... When he started this movement, and he started with his Bible and his concordance, and he began studying, and when he began studying, he saw the prophecies of the coming of the Lord, and because of this, listen to me, the slaves and many other people who are believers began to believe this message that he preached, and the ones that joined him were the ones that believed in abolition, which is slavery should be abolished. And almost 20 years later, 
God caused to bring about a political party in America that exists today. Anybody know what that party's called? The Republican Party. And they, they won in 1860. They won the White House. And they won both houses of Congress. And they gave the 13th Amendment at the end. And they freed the slaves. And that's why I'm able to preach to people who are of every race, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation, what was his message? Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Watch this. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell where? On the earth. How many people does that include? And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Now, we just read about this in the book of Isaiah. That judgment. The hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That was Miller's message. That was a part of what they, they came to find out was the first angel's message. But this was the heart of his message. Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the what? Sanctuary be what? And Miller said, God's coming to this earth to cleanse it with fire. You better get your life right. He's going to burn up the earth. And they gave all the verses from the Bible that talks about the earth being burned up and the works that are there and, and people were shaken. And everybody was thinking, oh, man, when that day came, they were all looking. And then it, then it didn't happen the first time. April, by April 19th, they were like, oh, praise the Lord. Because I was going to church because I was just scared. Lord, have mercy. Just like 9-11. Anybody here remember what happened after 9-11? If you're under 20 years old, you don't remember what happened after 9-11. After 9-11, you know what happened? Churches were full. Folks were sitting in church talking about, preacher man, preacher man, this in the Bible? Man, we're going to die. And all oh, man, all those preachers are like, finally. And they began to preach all their foolishness. And then people said, man, it's clear, man. I don't think we got to keep going here. See you preach. See, but the message came. And the message seemed to fail. But the message, the sanctuary they found out wasn't the sanctuary on earth but it was a sanctuary in heaven. But as they preached, they preached like Jesus said, and they said this and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. See, the prophecy showed that Jesus is coming back and soon and that it was time to get ready. But the problem was that there was about four million slaves who were longing for the same liberty of the gospel at the same time. And it could be said of them, as was said to about the people who lived in a little town, a little area just north of Judah and Jerusalem. The people in John 4, 35, Jesus said, say ye not. There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look upon the fields, for they are what? White, all ready to harvest. That means that they're ready. They don't look like the people you were looking for, especially because this verse, they're talking about white, all ready to harvest, and they were talking about black people. But at that time, it was illegal for them to, to learn how to read. I'll show you that you get lynched. I mentioned this before, but I'm going to show you again because they were still slaves. But then came that great war where, listen to me, more white people died for black people in America than any other war, all the other wars. See, people are like, I hate it when I hear, I hate white people. When I was 18, I got tricked in some of that foolishness. Started reading Malcolm X. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum long. I started reading Malcolm. 
I even, I even, I even ordered, I called up uh, Playboy magazine because I heard they had in the 1960s, they had an article with him. I said, can y'all send me the article? I don't want the magazine. I just want the article. And I got the article and I read all these things about Malcolm and I was just on the verge of, of becoming a, a nation of Islam. But then, then I read, oh wait, Malcolm left the nation of Islam because he said it was corrupt. I'm just saying what he said. And then I said, then I kept reading, and I'm like, oh, Malcolm was just being honest with what he knew. And Malcolm said the nicest white people he ever met were Seventh-day Adventists. It's crazy. I was like, wait. At the time, I didn't know, I didn't know what a Seventh-day Adventist was, but I, I remember finding out later. And it was crazy because this war, this great war, where 500,000 people died, the majority of them white, and, a, and almost half of them from the north. And this is why I'm saying this, listen to me, black people especially, white people are not our enemy. They're our brethren. Let me flip it. White people, black people aren't criminals. Black people aren't evil. Black people are your brethren. You know why? Because God is not racist. Otherwise, why would he say this? Go with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew, chapter 24. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 24. And verse 14. See, the message of liberty is a message of love. Matthew 24, 14, In this gospel the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto how many nations? All nations. And then what's going to happen? And then shall the end come. See, God's not racist. I'll read this quote to you I read before. It says, The United States was tested. The Lord God of Israel has looked upon the vast number of human beings who were held in slavery in the United States of America. The United States has been a refuge for the oppressed. It has been spoken of as the bulwark of religious liberty. God has done more for this country than for any other country upon which the sun shines. It has been marvelously preserved from war and bloodshed. God saw the foul blood of slavery upon this land. He marked the suffering that were endured by the colored people. He moved upon the hearts of men to work in behalf of those who were so cruelly oppressed. The southern states became one terrible battlefield. Review and Herald, December 17, 1895. Miraculous emancipation. The graves of America's sons who had enlisted to deliver the oppressed race are thick in its soil. Whose blood is in the soil? White people. White men. Remember that. When Black Lives Matter lies to you and tells you that you are an oppressed people, you are only oppressed if you believe it. Yes, there is systemic racism. Yes, if you go to court, you're likely to lose. Yes, so what? the opportunity for liberty, you can live free and go and do many things. I, it doesn't say fairness, it says liberty. Liberty and fairness are not the same thing. God never promised fairness, because if he did, you'd die for your own sins. I don't want fairness. I, I'm telling you straight up, I don't want fairness. I want liberty. It says... Many fell in death, giving their lives to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that were bound. God spoke concerning the captivity of the colored people as verily as he did concerning the Hebrew captives and said, I have surely seen the affliction of who, everyone? Wait a second. I've seen the affliction of who? Wait, here the prophet says that God calls those Negroes that were in slavery his people. Now watch this. And I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am what? Come down to do what? Deliver them. The Lord wrought in freeing the southern slaves. Review and Herald, December 17, 1895. Now watch this. The same way that he brought Israel out of Egypt, 
and he brought the 12 out of Israel, he brought the Negro out of slavery in America. And then after that, after the Civil War, right before Jim Crow, you had the experience. It will be necessary for the worker in the southern field not only to have an appreciation of the physical wants of the colored people, because they were really poor, but his heart must be aglow with the love of God. He must present what? When you go down to preach, what do you preach? You better start dressing right. You better stop eating them hog malls and chitlins. Or do you preach what? The love of God with faith and assurance and not follow any bleak, cold, methodical style. The southern field is a field where the religious instruction will have to be repeated what? You know why God wants to say the same thing again and again? Do you want me to tell you a secret about black people that many don't know? And it's true about many men. Amongst black people, reading is very difficult, especially amongst the men. And because of this, God in mercy sent the message that we'll talk about how he preached it. See, you and I need to work with people to help them in their reading. Reading, like the old saying is, fundamental. Without the ability to read, you'll be deceived. If you can't count, and somebody says, I just gave you, you know, change for a 20, but they gave you change for a dollar. Do you understand? It says... The language must be most simple in style. It's not because black people are stupid. That's not it. Listen to me. If you train your mind a certain way, there was a man who said he went down to a school, into a, uh, he went to one school and there was a bunch of mixed people, but it was primarily uh, Caucasian people. And he asked the children what they wanted to be when they grew up. And one said, I want to be a doctor. Another said, I want to be a lawyer. Another said, I want to be an astronaut. I, another said, I, I, I want to be you know, a business owner. They had all these different things that they wanted to be. Then he went to a, 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 a school where there were predominantly people of color, black people. And he says, what do you want to be? I want to, I want to play football. I want to play basketball. I want to do, I want to be a, a track star. What's the difference between those two outcomes? One is based on your physical ability. The other is based on the ability to read. That's scary. Because how many people make it to the NFL? How many make it to the, the, uh, the, 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 the NBA? And how, make, how many make it to the, to the Major League uh, ba uh, bas uh, Baseball? Very few. But you got tens of thousands and millions of little children from who, who their only hope out of their situation is, is strengthening their physical. And then they make it there, and then the first year they tear their Achilles. or they blow out their knee. They played in college, but they didn't really take classes seriously because they had to focus on their physical and not their intellectual. The language must be most simple in style, for many of the colored people are only children in understanding. But though this field has been long neglected, the words of Christ are applicable to it. Our Lord said to his disciples, Say ye not ye, say ye, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. The Southern Work, page 58. Now listen, this applies, listen to me, this plus principle doesn't just apply to black people, it applies to all people who are suffering. But for black people, God said, listen, I want you to understand this. When you go down and you talk to him, say, God has a special work for you. I remember God said to me when my dad rejected me, when I drove 2,000 miles from Sacramento to meet him for the first time, right after the year after my, dad, my, my adopted dad died and I became a Christian. And so I, 
he, I, he and I were talking because I was so mad at him. I was so upset because I was homeless and I was doing Bible work. It was in 2000. I was homeless and doing Bible work. And I, and I remember saying, if this man had been a man, I wouldn't be in this situation. And as soon as the thought came to my mind, the Lord said, you need to give that anger. You need to give that resentment to me. And then he, he put on my heart to call him. I had his phone number, just like my niece had my phone number. I had his phone number. So I went and got his number and I called him. And he answered the phone. And the first time I called him when my son was born, I called him to tell him, you have a grandson, somebody that's going to have your name. I just wanted to let you know. He acted, he acted pretty stupid. Oh, I'm not sure if you're even my son. Call him my mama ho. I'm like, don't lie. My grandma told me the truth. Both of y'all try to act up. And so then, and so then, but the next time I called him, he had been on dialysis. God knows how to humble a man. He, he lost his kidneys because of Agent Orange in, in uh, Vietnam. And so, and so he had been on dialysis and now he was more humble. And so we were talking and he was feeling bad about, uh, about not being a father and not being there for me. And so we talked for a couple of weeks and he said, you know, I'd really like to see you. I said, I'd really like to see you too, but you're in Chicago and I don't have a car. And, uh, and you know, I, he said, you know, I said, well, you know what? Let me ask my friend if, if I can borrow their car and drive to Chicago. Anybody in here got a friend let you borrow their car to drive Chicago? 2,000 miles one way? Not that many friends, right? And so I, so I mentioned it and I told my call porter team I was working with and they said, oh, we'll go with you. And one of them went to their mom and they said, well, Brother Tracy's trying to meet his dad. And this one, they didn't have a dad either. And, and the mom said, you know what, I'll give you the money. So they gave us like 150 something dollars and we made it to Chicago. We drove, it took us four days. 2,000 miles from Sacramento and we got to Sacramento and we got to Chicago and I, I knocked on his door. He was supposed to take care of everything, our housing. I don't have any money, our, our, our place to stay, everything. We got there. He was unprepared. He didn't do anything. And oh, man, my heart was broken. But I talked to him. It was nice to meet him at least. He said, we'll get together in a couple of days. I said, OK. So I went. We had some friends there in town doing evangelism. So we went over there and we worked with them, and then Sabbath afternoon, I called them. I said, hey, we're leaving tomorrow. You want to get together tonight for dinner or something? I was really hopeful. I was calling from the church phone, or from the Bible workers' home, actually. And I said, I was calling him. He said, you know what? I just think it might be better if we don't have anything to do with each other. Now, I need you to understand. It's like somebody took a knife and just went... I felt like I was about to die. I physically felt like I was about to die. I remember he said the words and it sunk in, but I was on the phone and one of my friends was there. It's like, what'd he say? What'd he say? Are, we, are you going to go meet him today? Are you going to go? They were so excited for me. I said, oh, you know, uh, we'll talk about it later. And then we went back to the house and I got on my knees and I cried for two hours straight. I bawled like a little boy, sometimes like, like, like little shepherd cries. I cried my heart out. And then I said, Lord, I didn't want to meet him. You told me to come here. I'm, I'm complaining to God now. You're the one that told me to do this. And then I remember God said something to me because this is the moral of the story. God said to me, I'm your father and I have always been your father. And I was in my in my mind later on. I said, well, when did you become my dad? My last name is Langston. Well, at the time it was Langston and not Smith. You know, I was a, adopted Smith, but I didn't change it legally. So. My name was Langston, which means one from a long town, which one from Babylon. That's what my name means. I was born Babylonian. When did you become my daddy? Well, you know what? He became my dad when he bought all black people. But he became my father when he redeemed Adam out of Eden. And we redeemed Noah. And then when he gave the promises to Israel, to the overcomer, and when he saved Judah, and then we saved Israel again. And when he called up the 12 and when the gospel was given by Paul to the Gentiles, he said, then. See Jim Crow. This is the one that's scary. The lynchings, black and white, black and white, black and white. Why? Because those people who they want us to believe are our enemies really have given themselves, many of them, to spare our lives. They're willing to give up their lives that we might have liberty. They had special laws for specific people. So,
all of these very sad things, Jim Crow happened to this people. But you know, God wasn't a racist, but you know what else God is not? He's not a classist. See, in America, you guys don't understand this, because if you go to India, there are three class, but you know, really there are five. And the, and the class system is just simply where, where you are born into a better class. In the north are the higher classes, and they are lighter skinned. In the dark, they're, dar they're darker people, and they're, they're the, the, the lower classes. And if they go to the same church and the dark and the lower class cooks food, those in the higher class aren't allowed to eat it. Second class citizens. And classism is, is defined as this. It's a noun. Prejudice against or in favor of a people belonging to a particular social class. And they are told to be on watch against the evils of classism. Jim Crow came into the church. God's remnant church. And it's still here. But God's not a classist. He especially in his church does he not want that. He doesn't want there to be a black church and a white church, which that's what there is now. And enter this man, John Manns, that we talked about before. And he came and the message he was sharing and in the early 20th century, he was sharing was, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. He said, listen, this message is for all of us, isn't it, brothers? But no, that got him into trouble. So this evangelist, which graduated from Oakwood, protested against the unchristlike attitudes and policies of the church. And when he did this, he was disfellowshipped in 1915. And so he was then sued in court for the church building, which the church built without any money from the, from the leadership. But a white Southern judge sided with man's in the black church. Now, why am I bringing this up? See, I'm bringing this up because I want this part to be recorded, these, this message specifically. But to end thing, this is taken from the, organ, the banner, and it was about his death um, and what happened with him, April 16, 1929 following an article published under the title of Random Notes from Port Lehman. And it says here, he immediately after the expulsion of Elder Manns, President Willis took him before the Bar of Justice in the city of Savannah, state of Georgia, compelling him to deliver the Savannah Church building to the conference, which, uh, which church Elder Manns and the people built without a cent from the conference. But alas, when the judge investigated the matter and saw how unjust and wicked the president of the conference was, he decided the case in Mel Elderman's favor and turned him down completely. The conference forbade him to preach and told him if he ever attempted to use the tithes in his work, he would be cursed by God and doomed to be burnt in hellfire. But the Spirit of the Lord impelled Elderman's to preach the word and carry forward the work of God irrespective of human restrictions. This he willingly did. And his efforts were blessed by the, with remarkable success. Therefore, since he could not bear uh, labor within the SDU denomination, he was forced to work on the outside. And by so doing, I do not see where he was opposing the irregular Adventist body. Now, I want to stop there. He did not hate the conference, and neither do we. They are our brethren just as verily as Israel and Judah were brethren as verily as Abraham and Lot were brethren. And this is my point that I want to make. Just because God will separate you does not mean that one is better than the other because to each he gives their work. It says, Elder Manns was never opposed to the regular Adventists. Neither did he sever his connection from them, nor was he establishing a new branch of his own or gathering a new cult. In the early days of the rise of the Seventh-day Adventism, the founders of the organization adhered strictly to the plain teachings of the Bible. They stood firmly for justice and equality to all men and upheld the theme that Jesus Christ came to this world and laid the foundation of the religion of a religion where Jews and Gentiles, high and low, black and white, free and bond, were, are linked together in one common brotherhood, recognized as equal in the sight of God. 
But as soon as the denomination began to grow in popularity and influence, they started to stray from the ancient past, Jeremiah 8.15, and began to practice racial prejudice, discrimination, and deceptive work of segregation, telling Negroes that colored people should not urge that they be placed on inequality with white people and also placed a permanent bar against Negro leadership in the denomination. Elder Manns and many other Negro ministers contended against such unchristian practices with a determination to follow the plain teachings of the Bible and to stand firmly for the fundamental principles which underlie the third angel's message by adhering strictly to the same, the big heads of the denomination being filled with injustice and prejudice in their hearts could not withstand the cutting truths of the Bible. Hence, they concluded that Elder Manns was re a rebellious, and if, he was, um, and if he was not thrown out on the outside of the organization, their high craft used to keep down the poor colored people would soon be spoiled. So, that group was called the Christian Negro Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1915, legally. Afterward, they filed in 1916 to change their name to the Free Seventh-day Adventist Church. And seven years later, in 1923, listen... In 1923, a hundred years ago this year, they changed their name to the General Assembly of Free Seventh-day Adventists. Why did I take this big point in the beginning to show you about this? Which one of these entities does God hate? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's my point. God loves all men. And God's going to have a people. Listen to me, saints. He's going to have a people who preach the Bible and the Bible only as the foundation for everything they believe in. So they can go to the red man, to the Native American. They can go to the black man, the white man. They can go to the man from Europe and the man from Asia. They can go to the man from Canada and the man from America. They can go to every woman. Women, listen to me, you now more than any time in human history have been placed in the same position almost like that of the woman in the garden. If you do the work, if you do Bible, where you do full time Bible work and you, you win souls to Jesus, you are able to receive the tithe. If you preach the gospel in song and you lead out in song and you are your primary work is to lead out in song, you are able to be paid of the tithe. If you win just as many souls as your husband or as the Bible worker or as anybody else, and this is the work that you're doing, you're able to be paid from the tithe. Do you understand what I'm saying, saints? God has brought it to now that the work of God is coming to a close. You see this right here? Anybody in here know what that is? That's the Liberty Bell. That's it there, too, in the, in the city of brotherly love. If you go there, watch yourself, because it's, it's lacking some brotherly love right now. I was there in 2016. You know, at the airport, they say, black boy, watch your luggage. Now watch. This bell has a verse on it, which is Leviticus 25, verse 10. And this bell says, proclaim liberty. There it is again. Proclaim liberty. This is, go, let's go to Leviticus 25 as we bring this to a close. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. Leviticus 25, verse 10. Saints, watch this now. This is the verse that this nation accepted as God, they believe God gave this verse for them in 1776. They had to take this bell and hide it. Because the British, when they would capture cities, they would take up uh, all the metal and they would make defenses with it or they would make uh, uh, armaments out of it. Leviticus 25, verse 10. Look what the Bible says. Now, this is the United States of American official Bible verse. And ye shall hallow the 50th year 
and proclaim liberty throughout what? All, All the land unto how many? All. All the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession. Wait a second. Everybody is allowed to own property in this land? Yes. And every man unto his family. See, this was God's plan for America. The only nation that promises liberty to how many? To all. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible what? Only, only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Ellen White. So saints. Jesus is coming soon. But in order for you and I to be ready, we need to have the faith of Jesus. And the message for this time is the message of love. It's the message of liberty. It's the message that God is no respecter of persons. Because we're preparing for the harvest. And this church has an intake process. And we just covered the message for this time. And we'll talk about the Constitution and bylaws at a later time. But the Lord promised that those who do not accept this message, he says he's going to lay them with the ground and their children within them, and that he would not leave in them one stone upon another because they knew not the time of what? Their visitation. He says, listen, you want to be a leader in God's church? You need to be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach. And for this cause, he says, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are what, everyone? And that's why I preach this message today. Not to preach against somebody else. Oh, pastors against a conference. I am not. It is my desire to work as closely with my brethren as I can. But the reason why I am here is because I have the liberty to do everything God told me to do without being told you cannot do that. Do you understand that's it? Do you want a husband, ladies, that tells you you can't go out and get Bible studies? You can't go to this church? You can't do that? You can't, you can't have evening prayer over there? You can't. Do you want a husband like that? No. Husbands, you want a wife that's mad at you because you go to church? Or because or you're going out and giving Bible studies or, or you're going out and singing and all this stuff? Do you want somebody that's married to you that does that to you? No. And God doesn't want that either. Why? For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of what, everyone? What's that say right there? The circumcision. That's those that claim to believe. You know what the Bible says you have to do to them? Titus chapter 1 verse 11. Whose mouths must be what? Stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. For what? Why are they doing it? Why were they, why did they treat those people so badly? Because they wanted to keep them in so they can keep the money and power to themselves. I'm going to move past this because I don't, we don't need to go through this. I've already covered these, these points. Okay. All right. So, in closing, when it comes to the work of God, medical missionary work and training is equivalent to the method. That's the method we use. We use medical missionary work as an opening wedge. Do you know, listen to me, saints, I know you have been trained to give away books. I want you to learn to stop giving away books. Stop giving away the great controversy. It doesn't work the same for this generation. When, you, when people go on their phones and they watch YouTube videos, which is watched more? The, the short videos or the long ones? You have Instagram, you have TikTok. Which videos do people like more? Long ones or short ones? When it comes to reading, people would rather read something short and small. That is why 
we are to give them tracts. That's why I make handouts. Because you can read that in a short amount of time, but you give somebody a book. And here's what they did to the great controversy. And I think it was in Ohio last year. A group got together and mailed every house, every address in a certain area, the great controversy. And it got on the news because people were taking them and using it for toilet paper. People were taking it and burning it. Listen to me. Why? They will reject the larger book, but they will accept the little things. Start small. Don't despise the day of small things. Give out tracts because they'll take it. And maybe it's like Dr. Vyth. It'll have something on it. And then later on, they'll pull it out of the drawer because they didn't throw it away and read it. It'll have a name or address or something. And they'll call and say, hey, can I do Bible studies with you? Our method has to match. Matthew 10, 1. And when he had given, when he had called his, unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. That's the, he called us and he gave us power. Power against unclean spirits. He gave us power. Power to do what? That's why in June we're having a medical missionary evangelistic series just reaching out to people to help them with their health do a survey what are the things people are suffering with and teach them how to help with that thing Luke 9 1 and 2 says the same thing similar and he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick he gave us what power and what else saints say it with me power and what authority that's right over what how many so if you have the devil that is tricking you into thinking you're addicted to something God gave you power over him power to cure diseases he sent us to preach and to heal and this is that this is what this verse says because God has the ability to touch you and I with healing power Watch this now. But when God touches you because he has the healing touch, he wants to touch you. But after he touches you, it's so that you can do what? Now you see how the gospel works. He wants to touch you. So you can say, you know what? Let me show you how to overcome appetite. Because this is what God did for me. Let me show you how to overcome alcohol. Let me show you. My wife can say, let me show you how to overcome weed. She used to be addicted to smoking weed. Sorry, I'm putting you on front street. Thank you. So, the message for this time is the message of liberty. And liberty equals making the captives free. And that's free to work. Free indeed. And the Lord answered and said, write the vision and make it plain. I'm going to stop there actually. So that's our last one. Are there any questions? Raise your hand if there's a question. Nothing? All right, there in the back. Somebody come, little one come. I got it right here. Raise your hand, brother. Good morning. Good morning, Saint brother. Um. First off, I didn't understand the correlation between all the coming out stuff and all the free Adventists. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll so, read a quote from you, okay? So you kind of lost me there. That's okay. I'll give it to you. This is taken from a book called 1888 Materials. And it's uh, page 357, okay? Okay. Sister White says, I was confirmed in all that I had stated in Minneapolis. This is talking about 1888. That a reformation must go through the churches. Reforms must be made for spiritual weakness and blindness were upon the people who had been blessed with great light and precious opportunities and privileges. As reformers, they had come out of the denominational churches. So the Seventh-day Adventist church came out of all the other denominations, right? 
As reformers, they had come out of all denominational churches. Excuse me. But now they act a part similar to that which the churches acted. We hope that there would not be the necessity for another coming out. While we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace, we will not with pen or voice cease to protest against bigotry. And she was talking about how they treated the, the, the people of color. And so the reason why these two things was to make in your mind understand that if God ends up calling a people afterward and he says, I need you to go do a work because I can't get the other ones to do it. He couldn't get Israel to do it, so he called Judah, right? He couldn't get Babylon to do it, so he called Israel. And so now, as a people, that's the calling. All right. Anyone else? All right, go ahead. Um, you had us read Hebrews 12 or 512? Yes. And it says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again to be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need milk and not of strong meat. Yes. Um, do you think that we should be teaching the saints or reteaching them the milk? Well, we have to do both, brother. You, listen, it's a, the church is a one-room classroom like the old school. And so you have those who are more advanced and those who are newer. You have to teach both simultaneously. Okay. All right, no problem. So finally, saints, if that's it, the message of Christ is to be in you. Faith in Jesus leads you to God, but the faith of Jesus will cause you to think like Jesus. He is striving to get us to accept the adoption, when we each take our place in the family of God, then he will come and receive us as his own. He will come and receive us as his own at the second coming. And that is the end of our talk. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your tenderness. Thank you for giving me this time. And now, Lord, I just pray that we would understand that no matter what, whether we are white or black, or somewhere in between, all of us have been called. As you called Noah, you have called us. As you called Abraham, you have called us. And with that calling, you have given us a message. And that's the message of love. That's the message of liberty. And you have called each and every one of us to lay hands on others, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, giving unto them the Spirit of God, helping them to recover from their illnesses and from their difficulties, restoring their families, restoring them back in their financial situations and whatever their need is. And Lord, we as a church here in Lewiston, Idaho, His Remnant Church, have accepted the call. I have accepted it, Lord. We have accepted it. So please help us to do the part that needs to be done. We have brethren that are in the larger denomination and, and many of them are doing the work and many of them are longing to do more. Help us to encourage them and to lift up their hands as well. Forgive us for where we have fallen and forgive us for where we have separated thinking that we are better than others. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Help us to be strong. Help us to love as you love and to work as you work. In Jesus' name I pray. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Invite the treasurer forward. The, um, okay, yeah. Or whoever's doing it. Thank you. I have the uh, privilege to do tithes and offerings, um, and everything is in the um, in your bulletin on the blue uh, page. Uh, tithes and offerings are not collected during the service, but you may place your tithes and offerings in the back held by the deacon or deaconess when you being. Um, what is that word? Asher. Huh? Asher. Oh, I'm sorry. Ushered. Yes. Um, 
I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, Tyson offerings are not collected during the service, but you you may place your Tyson offerings in the back held by the deacon or deaconess when you've been ushered out. You may ask to deposit the Tyson offerings in any of the offering donation boxes. Offering donation boxes are located in the back of the sanctuary in the foyer. Um, Main Fellowship Hall downstairs, and our offering needed monthly is 1707 a month. Our pastor does not receive a salary, but only receives his portion of the tithes that you graciously give. And you can give electronically, and everything is in right. the blue page again. You can give electronically, or you can contact our um, treasurer, Sister Candace. Um, with that, I would like to read a... Bible verse and is found in um, okay, it's found in First Corinthians nine fourteen. Even so had the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And um I would like to share another um something from the spirit of prophecy and is found in uh, Acts of the Apostles. Um Paragraph 74.2, God has now made a proclamation of the gospel dependent upon the labors and the gifts. Again, God has made a proclamation of the gospel dependent upon the labors and the gifts of his people. Voluntary offerings and the tithe constitute the revenue of the Lord's work. Of the means entrusted to men, God claims a certain portion, the tenth. He leaves all free to say whether or not they will give more than this. Okay, so with that, let's have a word of prayer. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, Lord, thanking you for the blessing that we receive um, this morning, Lord, the message that you had given us, Lord. Um, Lord, what a blessing to be here, Lord, to worship you on, on your Sabbath day. Dear Father, Lord, I pray that you will bless the offerings that are going to be received. Lord, I pray that you will, mu will multiply them, Lord, that they may be used um, for you. Service, Lord, to finish the work. Please, Lord, be with each and every one of us, Lord. Please um, help us, Lord, to gladly give whatever, um, whatever your portion is. Lord, please, please be with all of us, Lord, as we go through the Sabbath hours, Lord. And again, thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us, Lord, every single day. Lord, and all these things I ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We give thee by thine own, whatever it may be, all that we have is thine alone. I trust, O oh Lord, from Thee. Amen.